You're listening to Blockchain 2025. The future is right now. Every week, we explore implications of the technology underpinning cryptocurrencies, blockchain. Each episode is a standalone examination of one industry broken into three segments. A basic overview, blockchain's disruptive impact, and relevant crypto projects. Blockchain 2025 is part of the Bitcoin.com podcast network. Learn about Bitcoin, create a wallet, and buy your first Satoshis all at Bitcoin.com. He is a seasoned executive and product visionary. He started his career as a software developer. In 2005, he co-founded Narios, a P2P file sharing company. He also founded a desktop dictionary company acquired by iMesh called Wicked Up. He's had other impressive roles in big data analytics, and he holds a master's in applied linguistics and an MBA. Originally from Russia, but has spent the last 20 years in Israel. Alexander Zadelson, welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Pleasure to be here. Really excited. And first off, we mentioned this before the show. I, I just think it's really cool. I have other friends and other data points here. But why do Israelis have such a good, almost American accent? And you had a very interesting answer. <laughs> yeah, well, one, I think one of the reasons here, because it's a small country, uh, the movies are never dubbed. Maybe except for like cartoons for really little kids. So, and obviously kids like American culture and they watch a lot of movies and shows and everything. And it's always like in perfect English on the TV or in the cinema. So that's what kids hear and that's how they learn. And I think this is one of the important factors. That's really interesting. At first I thought it was like intentionally done by the Israeli government or someone up top to make sure they spoke better English, but it seems like a, a lucky coincidence because there was just not a big enough population that warranted paying for dubs. Yeah. Well, it's a, I think it's a combination. Yeah, but you're right. Very cool. Before we get into Beam, I'm just curious, applied linguistics, does that help you at all in your work with cryptocurrencies? I wouldn't say it helps much, but to me, you know, studying applied linguistics gave me a bigger understanding of, you know, the human, even I would say the human nature and, you know, the nature of language and also a lot of computer science because applied linguistics is a combination of actually understanding how speech works and how you can program stuff around it. So it's probably more the technical side that is helping me, you know, in the crypto world. But, you know, general understanding and speaking uh, a couple of different languages sometimes is really nice. So, yeah, because I, because I learned several languages like French and German and, and Spanish as well. So it's not such a great, not that I have like such fluency there, but I can understand stuff when I'm in Europe. So it's, it's fun as well. Very cool. So it helps you learn languages faster. Yeah. Let's go into it. So Alexander is the founder at Beam. Beam is a privacy-focused cryptocurrency based on a blockchain technology called Mimblewimble, right? That's a very high-level overview. So Mimblewimble, which is named after, you may have heard that before, is named after a Harry Potter spell, also known as the Tongue Tying Curse, that prevents an opponent from casting their spell. So the bulk of blockchain's past transaction data can be removed, Listeners, remember that if you're running a node of Bitcoin, you have to have every single transaction to run a full node on your computer that takes up a lot of space, you know, it's, uh, hundreds of gigabytes, right? You know, it's all based on this Mimblewimble technology. So before we go into Beam, you know, explain what Mimblewimble is to my grandma. Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Just a small correction. I'm not a founder. I'm the CEO of the company. Okay. But to Mim let's get to Mimblewimble. So as you mentioned in Bitcoin, the, the whole idea is that you have this public ledger of all the transactions and you keep the history forever and everybody can actually validate and verify everything on the blockchain, right? So in Bitcoin, you actually have addresses that have balances to them, right? In Mimblewimble, actually this genius person who uh, invented it, I would say turn the, the things upside down a little bit. So instead of having an address, as a user, you hold keys to your UTXOs, and the UTXO is an, is an unspent transaction output, but for simple people, you know, like I like to imagine this just a safe deposit box. In Mimblewimble, every user has one or more safe deposit boxes. Each one holds a certain sum, and I hold the keys to those or the codes to those uh, safe deposit boxes. Okay. And all the safe deposit boxes in the blockchain look exactly the same. So nobody knows who has the key and nobody knows what is inside. I just want to make sure that listeners got that because there's a lot of information there. So what Alexander said is Beam is a cryptocurrency 
And with Mimblewimble, basically, we all have our safety deposit boxes and our keys to the safety deposit boxes. But let's say Alexander has, you know, 10 million, the equivalent of 10 million US dollars in his box. And I only have 50 cents. There's no way from the outside to know how much is in each box. Exactly. The two boxes would look exactly the same size and exactly the same color. Okay. Now, let's say I want to send you half... Well, you said $10 million, right? Let's say I want to send you uh, $1 million. Okay, so what I would do is like this. I would open my deposit box. I would create two more boxes, and I would put $9 million into one of them and $1 million into the second one. And then I will send this whole structure to you, and I will give you the key from the second box where the $1 million is, okay? Because I, that's what I want to send you, right? So what you would do, you would take my key, open the box to verify that it really has what, what you want it to have, and then you would change the lock, you would change the key, right? And then it will destroy the original box, right? So now we end up with uh, one box of 10 million and then another box of nine and another box of one. And then we send this whole thing to the blockchain after we both sign it. We send it to the blockchain, to the node, so they can validate. Okay? Because, again, somebody needs to tell us here that this transaction is legal now. How do they validate? Right? Because they don't see the amounts. Hold on, Alexander. I'm going to do another summary there just to make sure. Yeah. And by the way, you're doing a fantastic job at breaking this down. It's not easy. Thank you. Thank you. It shows that you know your stuff. Okay, so... In this example, remember I just mentioned, you know, you had $10 million and you sent me $1 million. I had 50 cents. My original balance was very low. I, my original deposit box, I had 50 cents. That million you sent over to me, is that giving me an uh, additional deposit box or my deposit box is going to be combined into one? An additional, yeah, exactly. Your 50 cents just stay, it, it's not part of the whole thing. It just stays where it is. Okay, so now I have two deposit boxes. Exactly, exactly. So okay. in the end of this transaction, I will have one deposit box with $9 million because I eventually will destroy the original one. And you will have two, one with a 50 cents and another one with a million. And I'm also guessing that in terms of user experience, it will be much more seamless. It's not like, you know, let's say I go on a a trip with friends and everyone pays me $100 for the trip. All of a sudden I have like 500 accounts. There'll be a way to use my money seamlessly in terms of user experience. Yeah, absolutely. As a user, you are not really exposed to that. Like in our wallet, Okay. You just have one wallet which shows your money. You can also see your boxes if you want to in a separate screen, but it's for more technical guys. So from the user user experience, it's exactly the same. You still have your password, your 12 word, you know, private key thing. You don't need to think about all this complexity at all. Very cool. So I want to go on and explain about this verifications part. So the verification means, okay, well, how do we verify this is a valid transaction on the blockchain if it's, you know, that this is a private confidential transaction? How can we prove that Alexander sent me a million, that I have that, and then I got the keys, and that he destroyed, I guess, his, his 10 million? So Because if Alexander sent, you know, he duplicated, that wouldn't work. Yeah. So actually, what we uh, really want to prove here and validate is that no new money was printed. Right. Right. So how do we do that? Although nobody sees the exact amounts, but the the beam nodes receive the information about the three boxes, the original input box and the two output boxes, and they can validate that the total sum of the three numbers equals zero. Right. So they need to validate that 10 an input amount was divided into two other amounts, one of which went to the receiver and another one, which is a change, remained with the sender. And that the sum of the three, like actually A minus B minus C equals zero, right? Because if it doesn't, well, there is also a fee, but it's a minor detail, so that we also need to deduct a fee. Because otherwise we could have printed money, right? Because I could have, you know, if it didn't equal zero, I could take my 10 million, and give myself 5 million and give you 10 million, right? Or 15 million, or give me 15 and you 15, right? Effectively printing money. Yeah, this isn't the Federal Reserve. Yeah, exactly, this isn't the Federal Reserve, so we really, uh, printing money is not really liked in our world, and that's one of the reasons why it all sprang up, right? So we validate that the sum is zero, but there is one more neat trick, right? So here we're not talking about paper bills, 
we're talking about numbers. Just remember, we just validated that the sum is zero. But what if I took 10 million, gave you 20 million, and gave myself minus 10 million? So the sum would still be zero, right? 10 minus 20 minus minus 20 is uh, minus minus 10 is zero. So I take 10, give you 20, and give me minus 10. So the input plus minus the outputs equals zero again, right? 10 on one side, 10 on the other side. Now, what's the problem here? Two problems. One, suddenly you have 20 million where, you know, I originally had only 10 million. And even a bigger problem is that in, you know, computer stuff, you know, minus 10 million leads to an overflow and might generate like an insanely huge amount for me. Right. And let me just say that again. And also, I mean, it's a deposit box. The lowest number your deposit box can have is zero. You can't have negative $10 million in a deposit box. Yeah, that's right. So that's why I said, because this metaphor works really nicely, but since we're talking about numbers, we still need to check that all the numbers are positive. Right. Now, and to do that, how do I do that if I don't know the number, right? Because it's easy for me to show that, you know, this, uh, whatever, the time on this iPhone is positive because you just see it and you val verify that 18 is more than zero. But how do I prove it to you if you don't see the actual number? So for that, we're using a, a flavor of zero knowledge proofs, which is called bullet proofs. It's uh, something that has been developed by Benedict Bunz okay. in Stanford. And this is a, a way to prove that a number is, is positive or actually that is in a certain range without actually disclosing the number. And that's what our nodes are doing. So they look at each transaction and say, ah, okay, let's check that the sound, the, if we take the inputs and the outputs, they are equal. And let's also s validate that everything is greater than zero. Okay, once we have those two things, and that's the genius of Mimblewimble. Once we have those two things, we know that the transaction is valid, okay? That somebody had owned some deposit box and then divided it into two deposit boxes in the legitimate way. And now one side owns one side of that and the other side owns the other side of that. And no new money was printed during this transaction. Okay, now let me bring it back to cryptocurrency, right? It's got to be used as a currency. This is a store of value. I think that's important to be used in commerce. Yeah, so we it will be used as both. So the store, store of value is a very, very valid and important use case yeah. for Beam. But eventually it will also be used as a payment currency. Absolutely. Sure, right. And well, I guess I wonder, Alexander, I mean, this, we don't have to go too deep into the question. And I know there's different stages of building money. But can you have store of value with a cryptocurrency without it being used as a currency? Well, I think that's that's a philosophical question. Well, can you have store of value in gold without having gold used as currency? Uh, can you have store of value in art without art being used as currency? I would say yes, right? I mean, I could store my savings in a Picasso painting and I cannot really buy anything. Right. But there's tangible value. I mean, like you can go see the painting, like you can touch it with your hands, whereas a cryptocurrency is just a, a digital file. Yeah, I think in this respect, it's similar to to kind of to say gold, because, right. you know, gold is I mean, it is tangible in in, sorry, in a new way, right? Because you, you can prove that you have those tokens. Yeah, it's a very interesting philosophical question. I would say it's still tangible in, in a certain amount. I mean, it's not just arbitrary bits and bytes. It's bits and bytes that are proven by the history of the blockchain and they and it makes them real. So I would say in general, yes, you could have store of value without using this being used as currency. But I think in, in the case of cryptocurrencies, uh, those things go together. Gotcha. Because, you know, cryptocurrencies are very easily transferable, very easily divisible. So it makes perfect sense to also use them as means of payment. Okay, good answer there. And to finish that question off, or like a follow up here would be if I'm a merchant. So basically what you described is Let's just say I, at my store, you come in, you pay me in Beam 100 bucks or something, and you want to return it. I'll say, well, prove to me that you sent me 100 bucks. You'll be able to prove to me that you sent me 100 bucks, which is you know, obviously necessary. But when it comes back to, to value, I'm jumping around a bit here because I do know that Beam is backed by a treasury. So two-part question here. One, how are decisions made by this treasury, which is going to receive 20% of total rewards, mining rewards over the next five years? Yeah. So if you can answer that question, how are decisions made and how will you spend that money that's raised by the treasury? Okay. That's a great question. So the goal of the treasury actually is to support development 
of Beam. Now, as you correctly mentioned, 20% of all the coins minted in the first five years will go to the treasury, okay? Now, from the treasury, the coins are divided to three constituents. The first is the investors, right? The guys who actually took their money, put it at risk, invested in us. The VC founders of your startup, right? No, we, we actually have uh, several very respectable VC funds that are, well, they were not the founders, they just invested into the project as it goes, right? Yeah, yeah. Total of uh, slightly over $4 million uh, at the moment. Right. Okay, that's, that's the size of the investment. So these guys will be getting their coins from the treasury, okay, during this five-year period. Now, the original team, the core team of Beam, you know, people who are actually working day and night now to make it happen, will also be getting their share. And this is right for advisors as well and for, for people involved. And there is another part, uh, which is 20% of this treasury, right? That will go to a foundation, a nonprofit foundation, which we're now in the process of setting up. We are targeting Switzerland. Uh, this seems to be like the best place for that. And the goal of the foundation is to take this money and invest it into further development, maintenance, research, awareness, and other good things to support Beam specifically, the wider financial privacy agenda, and adjacent causes. Now, one of the reasons we wanted to set it up is because we are a company, right? And we don't think it's a good idea in the long term for a company to control the coin, right? Because company usually is like a for-profit animal. Some people think it's, you know, a greedy capitalist uh, thing, which it probably is and should be. But if a nonprofit foundation is something much more suitable for doing something that's built for the common benefit. And our goal is to attract very respectful and knowledgeable people from the community to run the foundation. We don't plan to run the foundation. Okay, we want to attract a board of, we will still have to decide five to seven people who will be running the foundation and who will be distributing those funds to meet the goals of making Beam currency better and making, you know, the financial world better in general, promoting privacy, doing cryptographic research and all the stuff that helps this cause. Very interesting. Now, let me break this down. I mean, obviously, you're different than Bitcoin in a lot of ways, but just the main is, you know, I'd say privacy focused, right? It's a confidential anonymous transactions. So you have that and you also have a company behind it. And then you have a nonprofit foundation, which you could argue for Bitcoin, but it's not the same thing because it's you know, your nonprofit foundation is much more connected to your company. Because of that setup, what, if any, regulatory risks do, does Beam face? Well, we don't see much regulatory risk at all. We are classified as a currency token. So we're not a utility, not a security. And we're actually developing the software. We're not holding other people's money at all. We're not providing any financial services. So we're developing the software. We're releasing the software absolutely for free. I mean, it's obviously open source and free to use to the world. And that's it. So we're not dealing with customers. We're not providing financial services. So we don't envision any regulatory pitfalls here. Gotcha. Okay. You mentioned this. I'm going to link from an article. This is on uh, Beam's Medium blog about Zcash and Monero, two worthy competitors in the privacy coin space and the two biggest as of now. So Zcash has excellent privacy features, but they are computationally heavy. It needs a That's lot of right. computational power and see little use so far. Scalability is better than Monero's, but still poor and audibility Auditability, tough word to say, is poor as well, although you have plans to improve it. Auditability is basically what we talked about, proving that, you know, you made that transaction, right? Monero, you said, you know, Monero scores very well on confidentiality, poor on scalability, and also poor on auditability. So in comparison to Zcash and Monero, to sum things up, is it, do you think you're going to be a, a more favorable currency because of the gains you're getting on scalability and auditability? Yeah, that is right. Now, I must say that this article is somewhat outdated. Because since then, Zcash has released an upgrade called Sapling, which really speeds up the computations. So before that, really creating a private transaction on Zcash was like it could take a minute or two, depending on your computer. But still in Zcash, most of the transactions are public. So that by default, 
your transactions are public. I don't have data about what is the percentage of private transaction right now, but I don't think the default policy changed. Now, Monero also moved forward. They also released an update and they improved their scalability by a factor of five, actually. Still though, according to our calculations today, Monero is about five times heavier in terms of the blockchain size than Bitcoin, assuming, you know, to assume the same, the same amount of usage, right? Obviously Bitcoin's blockchain is bigger, but if Monero had the same amount of transactions, then it would be like five times larger than Bitcoin, which is like one terabyte. It would be one terabyte. Now, Zcash is about nine times heavier in this respect so than, than Bitcoin. What we expect from our implementation is that we'll be three to five to maybe even 10 times smaller than Bitcoin because our blockchain, remember the, the safe deposit boxes? So our blockchain actually doesn't grow that much with the number of transactions as with the number of those safe deposit boxes. Because you're burning those old safe deposit boxes. Yeah, we're burning the old ones, exactly. Right. And the design is more elegant, so it's much more scalable. And when you say scalable, how many transactions per second are, you, are we looking at? Okay, so, so when we say scalable here, we actually mean the blockchain size, right? Meaning like how small a device, how, how long time you need to get to spend to get the blockchain downloaded and verified. For users that want to run a node or a copy of the blockchain to verify things. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So this is our main... Now, in terms of transactions per second... We expect to have about 17. It's not a huge number. We're not targeting any huge number. We're a classic proof of work coin. So every transaction needs to be distributed to everyone and it takes time. So don't expect any high speeds there. But there are very nice second layer solutions right now. Lightning is one of them. And there is a lot of talk right now about Lightning. So we are researching it very hard uh, and we hope to be able to release a, some sort of a POC in the beginning of next year. And this will actually be the solution for fast transactions, right? So, so the, the, the low transaction speed on, on the first layer, on, on the blockchain layer, doesn't really worry us because we know that the whole, like a large part of crypto world and some of the best minds are working on solutions like Lightning and we will be just implementing and adapting their solutions to our blockchain. The beauty of open source. Yeah, exactly. Amazing, man. Well, excellent job here. I do want to talk about something. Now, this is just privacy coins in general against non-privacy coins. Maybe, I'm guessing you've probably thought about this. You know, what if the EU and the US government come out and say, you know what, Bitcoin is legal in commerce, can be used in commerce, but all privacy coins like Beam, Zcash, Monero are forbidden to be used in commerce. One, what's the chance of that happening? If you want to comment on that. And two, what do you think the effect would be if that did happen? I actually also have a three, like what will happen or you know, would happen with Beam and how Beam addresses that. So I think the chance of this happening is not very high because I don't think you can really effectively prohibit something like private currency, right? It's really hard to go and check all the computers and all the, the cell phones of everyone to make sure they're not using private currency. And I think the government officials should probably understand that prohibiting something might even create a spike of interest and might even bring people to that sort of prohibited thing, right? Now, I don't think it is very likely that this one ha will happen. What may be prohibited is the on-ramp and off-ramp. So we know that, for example, in Japan, crypto exchanges are not allowed to list private currencies at all. I think, though, that there is a lot of interest for those private currencies in among the Japanese public and crypto enthusiasts, right? Because, again, it, it makes this uh, forbidden fruit even, even sweeter to them. And I don't think there is any practical way for any law enforcement to really go and check every, every person's phone and see whether they do or don't have a, you know, a cryptocurrency wallet, right? So this is very hard. Now... Getting to businesses, and here is something, there is a very important part of our vision. So we don't want just to create a confidential currency. We want to create a confidential currency which people can decide to use in a compliant way. Meaning the users can decide to create an audit trail for themselves 
and then to demonstrate this audit trail to whoever they choose to, right? So actually think of an auditor, a, you know, we talked about businesses, right? Let's say I'm a business and I want to accept cryptocurrency, right? And I'm kind of checking what's out there. Okay, I look at Bitcoin. It's a great technology, you know, a long time on the market, the biggest by far. But then, hey, it's all open. It's all public. So all transactions that I do are remain there forever and people see how much I'm receiving, how much I'm spending. And even with some sophistication, who am I getting money from and who am I paying to, right? So think of it, no business would agree to that, right? I mean, having all your finances exposed doesn't really work, okay? Because if we're competitors in supply chain, right? Let's say we were, we're both making similar products. I go, oh, I know who's supplier, right? That's the big deal. Exactly, exactly. And just knowing, you know, the revenue of your competitor gives you a huge advantage, right? So, so you don't want to, you would, you would never do that, right? Even, you know, the public companies, they, they expose just whatever they are absolutely required by law to expose. They would never go into details for the, like, how much is, is the cost of this camera in this iPhone? I mean, it's like one of the best guarded secrets, I guess, in the industry. So, so this is one. Now, but I, as a best I can say, well, but there is this great private currency, you know, there's Zcash and there's Monero. So why don't I use them? I could, but then, you know, the year ends and I have to submit my report to, you know, I have my, need my auditors to review my financials. I need my tax people to review my transactions and I need my bank to, you know, I would want to convert this money to fiat, right? Because fiat is not really going anywhere that fast, right? I think it's kind of clear to everyone that, you know, probably in the, in the coming five, 10 years, we'll still have banks, we'll still have governments, we'll have all the stuff that, that we have now. So... With Monero and Zcash, this kind of audit is impossible or almost impossible. So, so again, as a merchant, I say, well, no solution. Now, what we want to build is a currency that is on one hand confidential. But on the other hand, if I'm a business, I can from, from the get-go decide, okay, I am auditable. So I will be adding some additional stuff for each of the transaction right on the blockchain. And then I'll be able to show this, to disclose this to an auditor by providing them a special key. So you can think of it as like attaching an envelope to each one of my safe deposit boxes, okay, just, just as a metaphor. So, and then the auditor can actually open those envelopes and see what's inside and have a proof that what's in the envelope equals to what's inside the box, okay, in terms of the money. Right, like so for taxes, if I have an e-commerce store and I accept Beam, I say, hey, you know, I earned $35,000 US equivalent of Beam last year, I can prove that these transactions happened. Right. Okay. okay. And here is proof. And here is the list of all transactions. Here is here are the here are the signatures. And, and even each one of the transactions has like the you know the, the cashier slip or the invoice you know attached to it, so that I can show that this was for for a song and this was for a book and this was for something else. For sure. Okay. And this is all also signed now. And I can do that without disclosing the privacy of the buyer if I don't have to. Right. Like say if I'm you know a a grocery store. Right. Whenever I come to a grocery store, I pay them with cash, but they still have to give me this this slip, right? So then they show those slips to the auditor, but they don't disclose my privacy at all in any way. But if I'm buying a house, right, then there is like this big uh, contract and then everybody knows who's the seller and who's the buyer and it's reported and so on and so forth. So all those levels of reporting will be supported on Beam. Now, this is a big task. As we're getting close to launch of the mainnet, when we launch the mainnet... And when will the launch be? It should be by the end of the year. Okay. By this year, okay? And today is December 17th, so we'll know pretty soon. Yeah, it should be pretty soon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We will launch Beam as a confidential cryptocurrency. And in the beginning of 2019, we'll start working very hard on defining the exact use cases for this compliance slash audit features and the exact implementation because it's very complex. We do have the support for that. We understand how technology would work, but the exact use cases and the exact best practices will need to be developed and we will be working with very reputable and knowledgeable partners to help us do that because it's a really big task. It's not just about technology, but about, you know, compliance and regulations and all the stuff around it. 
For sure. Now, a quick lightning round question here. I realize it could go pretty deep, but just on the surface level, you know, using Mimble, Wimble technology, so far, it's not just Beam. There's also another cryptocurrency called Grin, and there may be more in the future. What are the just the top level main differences between Beam and Grin? Sure. So Grin is a very respected project. They were actually the first to start implementing Mimble Wimble about two years ago. They are completely uh, distributed, community-based, not funded. Now, there are some technology differences. They're using the Rust programming language. We're using C++. In terms of mining, they're using a different algorithm. We're using Equihash. They're using a, a family of uh, Cuckoo Cycle-based algorithms. In terms of the monetary policy, there is a big difference. They are not capped supply or inflationary. So they have constant emission forever. And we have capped supply very similar to Bitcoin over 133 years. Isn't like one coin created in Grin every minute, something like that? They're doing 60 coins every minute. That's right. Forever. Okay. Okay. And, and we have a uh, halving uh, every four years, which eventually ends after uh, 32 halvings, if I'm not mistaken, 32 or 33. And also, I think that this whole talk about potential compliance is not something Grin will be interested to even discuss. Those would be the main differences, yeah. Thanks so much. Well, Alexander, fantastic job. Beam can be found at B-E-A-M, beam.mw. And Alexander, you know, if listeners want to reach out to you because they have more questions about the Beam project, how can they get in touch? So I think the best way to get in touch with us is through our community in Telegram. It's very lively, very high quality people. So the link is right there on our website. We also have Medium. We also have Discord and uh, a bunch of other platforms. But I would say Telegram is something I personally prefer. We always have somebody to answer questions there. And I am also there, you know, all most of the time. So I would say this is the best way. Thank you so much, Alexander. Listeners, go to podcast.bitcoin.com to see the show notes, timestamps, links to things we talked about. And as always, subscribe on iTunes, share, tweet, help us get the word out there. We put a lot of effort into the show and great guests like Alexander. All right. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. There are actually a couple of remarks that I wanted to add, but I don't know if we can still squeeze something in. For sure. Okay. So at Beam, we actually look at what we're doing very, very seriously. We understand we're building a currency that we want people to use and to store their money in. I mean, you know, we, we spend time engineering and testing, and we actually went to great lengths to perform a lot of security audits. We actually employed three different companies and five different individuals who are doing and most of them are actually already done with the security audits will be publishing the results pretty soon again the goal being to give everyone confidence that the code they're going to use to mine trade store beam is really good quality and good luck Thanks for listening to the Bitcoin.com podcast network. To learn more about our shows, visit Bitcoin.com forward slash podcast. Bitcoin.com podcast network.